God our Father and from our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. Amen. In our gospel reading this morning, we find that great haul of fish that is caught after Jesus had finished preaching. They set out into the deep. They labored all night. Professional fisher with no results. And since they were fishermen, it also meant there was no pay for all night's work. In the morning after Jesus had commanded their boat, uh, commandeered their boat rather, for the purposes of preaching, and as a platform, he tells them to set out for that catch. Peter's skeptical. He goes along with it. You know, let's humor the preacher. But Peter has already been a witness to some very great miracles. Several of them. He'd seen the driving out of the demoniacs and Jesus healing many people. The last chapter of Luke. So Peter had a precedent for going along with Jesus. But it's his reaction that I think is a bit unexpected. A large number of fish was caught so that they needed to get the help of another boat that was nearby in their nets as well. Their, net, their nets were ripping, tearing, and they filled both boats with fish so full that both boats were in danger of sinking. I think it's safe to say that this was not an everyday occurrence. Not something that happened to them very often. In fact, it's very likely that nothing approaching this had ever even happened before. This was a first. I think it's Peter's reaction, though, that has me most interested in this morning's gospel. And it's wildly reminiscent of the reaction of Isaiah in our Old Testament text. Did you catch it? Isaiah says, in the year that King Uzziah died, I saw the Lord. He describes the majesty of the throne room of God. The angels swooping around the throne, singing that unending hymn that we will sing in just a few moments. We'll join with angels and archangels and all the company of heaven and sing holy, holy, holy. And Isaiah says, at the sound of their voice, the thresholds shook and the temple was filled with smoke. And Isaiah's reaction is to his dread. Woe is me, he says, for I am a man of unclean lips and I dwell among a people of unclean lips in my eyes have seen the Lord, the Almighty. Peter, at the catch of fish, recognizing all that Jesus had done, his, his miracles, and then filling both boats so full that they nearly were sunk, realizes who he's in the boat with. And it got very real for him very fast. And he has the same reaction. He falls down and says, Go away from me, Lord, I am not worthy. I'm a sinner. He feels undone. They each have a sense of dread over their sinfulness before the holiness of God. I always get a kick out of people who tell me, Pastor, you know, I've got a lot of questions. And when I get to heaven, I'm going to go right to God and say, How come this and why that? You ever heard that before? You know what I think? I think that our reaction is going to be the same as Paul, I'm sorry, Peter, and the same as Isaiah. I think that we are going to be overcome by the awesomeness and the holiness of God. I think our reaction is going to be like theirs. I think that this is what people felt in the scriptures whenever a holy angel would appear. I think that because the very first words out of their mouth is, 
do not be afraid. <laughs> you know, because I think they were. A holy angel emanating the holiness and the majesty of God is startling for sinful people. It's a natural reaction to the awareness of our great guilt of sin as we stand before the judge. And that is the primary use of the law, the second use. It condemns us all. Lex sempracusat, the reformers said. The law always accuses us. Not because the law of God is mean. It's holy. But because we are sinners. It accuses us because we have broken the law. And there is no excuse. There was no excuse for Isaiah. There was no excuse for Peter. And there is no excuse for you and I. We're lawbreakers. And even if you could stop sinning altogether, that changes nothing. What if we try harder? What if we do better? Maybe in thought, word, and deed, we can begin to change the way we are. But even if you could stop sinning altogether, it doesn't make up for the past. It doesn't change what we've done. We've rebelled against God. But this is the answer for, of all world religions, even some Christian denominations. Try harder. Do better. Reform your behavior. Of course, that approach does nothing for your inward thoughts, hidden to all, but laid bare before God. God the judge of all hearts sees what is done in our hearts in secret. Because all actions come from there anyway. That is where he judges us. It is this that God had to deal with us about in order to save us. The heart problem. Our inward most thoughts, our secret selves, our hidden nature. Here is where God and his law accuses us. And that's where the accusation strikes. And Isaiah and Peter knew it immediately. And so we will too. But this is where Christianity, authentic biblical Christianity, differs from the rest of the world religions and some Christian denominations. They all get the question right. How can I be saved? But they all get the answer wrong. The answer for every other religion is, you do it. Make yourself better. Pull yourself up by your own bootstraps. Be moral. Behave yourself. But the testimony of Scripture is that you are incapable of doing it for yourself, and that is the history of the world as well. Therefore, in order that God and His great love for the world might save the world, He sent His only begotten Son, to die for the sins of the world. He has taken all of it out of our hands because we screw it up. He has taken the burden of salvation upon himself. God, eternal God, took on human flesh and was born into our world, into this creation, in time. The Creator taking on the very nature of creation. God breaking into our time space to save us. He lived in perfect obedience to the law in ways that we couldn't. That is, word, deed, and thought. Even in His innermost thoughts, 
Christ was perfect. Because we can't be. And we won't be. And he died paying the debt for the sin that we owe in order to set us free. Forgiveness and eternal life are all, belong to all who trust in the finished work of Jesus Christ on the cross, which was done for them and you and me in our behalf. God moving for those who couldn't and wouldn't move for themselves. On your behalf, <coughs> yours and mine, he has set us free. Jesus has set you free, and who the Son sets free is free indeed. Amen. Amen. Having heard the word of God, how